Thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah, I'm very grateful to, to Sam for inviting me to, to be the profile poet for this issue and also um, the co-selector. Uh, I'm also very grateful to um, Claire Best here for writing a uh, generous and, um, and thoughtful profile. I'll start with a poem which started its life as an attempt to write the biography of the street I grew up in and which ended up being something rather different. I don't quite know how to describe what it ended up as, some kind of psychogeographical explanation perhaps. Um, but I'll leave you to make your own mind up. It's called The Avenue. Time was I knew the occupants of every terraced house, whether they took the mirror, express or sketch, where they went on holiday and what they tipped at Christmas. Rumour had it, Ralph Richardson once lived across the road from where my parents lived, next to the Woods, who'd lived there longer, next to the Hancocks, who'd lived there longer still, next to the Honeys, who'd surely seen the avenue built around them. On the other side, they dealt in God, big time, at the Kingdom Hall, where we played scratch cricket any day but Sunday, against thick glass doors. There's still a patch of ground where number 13 stood, raised by the Luftwaffe and never rebuilt, magnificent in its absence, the avenue's own ground zero. And the curtains are drawn where Harold Butterworth lived. He took the Soviet weekly and wore a Khrushchev hat, but everyone agreed he was too mad to be bad. I have seen the avenue in sunlight, rain and snow, as live spectacle and preserved on shaky Super 8 with more trees than now seem possible and a solitary Morris Minor. Now it's to reclaim my innocence that I come here to sleep in the bed where I dreamed the dreams of adolescence and learnt what nightmare means. To this house from which aged five in a winter when snow lay thick and powder fine for months I ventured forth took the first steps on the 800-yard journey to school, to terra incognita. It's Christmas Eve, and I'm not there, but I remember all those Christmas Eves I made my way down the avenue at dusk, looking in on all the lives in living rooms, the trees and paper chains and cribs, and I see time future contained in time past, and understand at last why home is where we start from. Clips. Between us, we've spent 150 years on this blue planet, my mother, my daughter and I, who've come together in the postage stamp garden of my childhood home to gaze into the darkest reaches of this cold March night at a moon made strangely local. Contours clear as the chimneys on next door's roof but rendered unfamiliar by their ruddy hue, like some hapless worthy unaccustomed to the source. And our three worlds spin as one, three generations reduced to bogey's hill of beans by the dimensions of the night. They can claim a kinship with the moon that I am denied, but for one tiny moment the mystery they share is diminished by the wonder that is mine as much as theirs. Changing the tone slightly, the next poem is for everyone who's, or anyone present who's misspent youth, may have spent, may have involved watching the wrestling between four o'clock and five o'clock <laughs> on a Saturday afternoon <laughs> as the grand finale of World of Sport. Cathartic. Some have sprung fully formed from the loins of Laurel and Hardy, while their opponents are all clinical brutality and technical precision. Wrinkled bodies that seem to flaunt their human imperfections, vast uncharted terrains of unstable gut, perched on pale and reedy pins, confront Greek gods, their oiled limbs and torsos improbably honed, and the script author unknown, 
decrees whose form is slammed or posted where, whose bleats of agony come next, who endures the Boston crab or forearm smash before the final dramatic concession. And this tragic comedy, in however many acts, plays out to an audience of two at the end of a Saturday afternoon way back when. And I am half that audience, and the other half, whose pity and fear demand a lot more purging than mine, is 65 years older and my grandmother. <laughs> when the bells rung and it's over, and giant haystacks and rollable Rocco, or mad dog Bromley and crybaby Cooper, or whoever, have limped or stridden back to their dressing rooms, she sighs, turns on the light in our dark parlour, turns off the football results, and as she picks up her Barbara Cartland, says softly to me, her favourite grandson, make us a cup of tea, will you duck? <laughs> My daughters and I trek through heavy snow to visit Anita Vronsky in Berlin. We weren't invited, but after the distance we trekked through snow, the like of which they'd never dreamed, she could hardly turn us back. And so we step into the welcoming glow, all stamping feet, rubbing hands, and catching breath after a mere half hour in the ice-bound city. And Anita greeting us like her longest lost cousins, grasping us to the stove-like warmth of her breast, and serving us runny scrambled eggs and shinken with heavy slabs of thick black German bread. And the girls come back to life. Sensation returns to fingers, toes, eyes shine while I sip hot black coffee. And outside, the pavements grow heavier and heavier. Pulled uh, through the brickworks to the hills. On November coloured days, he felt the disenchantment of the world and reproached it for abandoning all meaning for his sense of losing something that he'd never had. The insistence of rain wrote a score as sweetly apt as Rachmaninoff's for brief encounter, and his thoughts drifted to drowned dogs, rain-soaked, claggy earth, and what it was like, once, to wake early in the attic room the first morning of summer, sunlight dappling wallpaper, with the prospect of the pathway through the brickworks to the hills. Thank you very much.